This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 2 of Puck Poolies, Episode 1. It's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis. We're working out the kinks, getting ready for a new season of fantasy hockey. And Stephen, it's good to be back after our small layoff. And I wanted to ask you first, what have you been up to, buddy? How's the summer going so far? Well, you know, I, I haven't uh, had a lot of downtime. It's been kind of just a lot of stuff to do, a lot of hockey to watch, actually. I've been kind of going back and getting ready for this 2024 draft. I got to say, probably since July 5th, I think I've watched close to 40 hockey games. Um, so, and, and it's August 24th when we're recording this. So it's been quite a bit, uh, but uh, it's going to be nice going camping soon, going to be doing that and uh, getting to some races, getting to some hockey games, obviously. And now I'm on a farm. So if you start seeing a bunch of cows walking behind me, uh, that would be a problem because I'm inside a building. But uh, yeah, if you start seeing some cows, that would explain that. But how about you? How's your, how's your summer been going? Well, it's funny. It's actually a douchey question for listeners for me to ask Stephen how his summer is going because actually I was on vacation and Stephen was covering for me. So he has not taken his vacation yet. I'm like, hey, what you been up to? He's like uh, covering for you and working. He will <laughs> finally get a break soon. But uh, yeah, I just got back from my own vacation, a lot of family time, seeing Barbenheimer, all that kind of stuff. Pretty low key this summer compared to my my last summer, which was full of bachelor parties and weddings and stuff. So I was glad to keep it relatively low key, feeling good, feeling refreshed. And uh, Stephen, we're going to talk today about the top 300 fantasy rankings, which I've put out. We're up to two editions now. I did an update this week after getting back. So if you're ready to dive in, we can start the show, my friend. Yeah, I got to point out that uh, like I've, I've kind of made it clear before. I'm not a huge um, movie guy. I don't go to a ton of movies. Um, but the one thing I did do recently was I did go to, uh, in Newmarket, Ontario, I did go to, uh, a drive-in. So I, I never really kind of experienced that before. So that was kind of cool. I know that's, that sounds kind of crazy, but I saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. And then I saw the, the Spider-Verse movie for the second time. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie, I recommend that by the way. Um, but yeah. So, so great. Loved it. Did loved you? it. Loved the yeah. animation. Love the sort of throwback to the feel of the early or late 80s, early 90s movie. And I love the voice acting in it. It was fantastic. That was my favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. And I can't say like I'm a huge fan, but there were a few of those movies I just could not care about. And, uh, you know, for the, the animation style reminded me a lot of the, the first Spider-Verse in particular. Uh, and I didn't love the animation on that one. But the second Spider-Verse movie to me is the, is unbelievable. Great movie. Definitely watch it. Um, but yeah, let's talk about hockey here. That's why we're here. Uh, all right. So uh, I guess you can uh, kind of break down the, the ranking parameters for uh, for how you put this list together. Yeah, we're going to talk about certain things that stand out in the rankings. But if you're uninitiated to the rankings, which are on dailyfaceoff.com now, I just want to let you know a couple little parameters. So the way I do this list, I slowly compile it uh, in July after free agency. I do a first version, then a few weeks later, I come back to it sort of with fresh eyes and think, okay, what was I doing? Why was this guy so high or so low? And as we get closer, the reasonings for each adjustment to the rankings change. So in September, it'll be training camp. It'll be very various injuries that might pop up to players that could affect the rankings. It could be positional battles, rookies who make the team or don't make the team. So updates will get more and more frequent. And if you're wondering just what scoring system they're based on, which is very important, the categories I use, it's basically the configuration of my actual league. Goals, assists, plus minus, shots, power play points, blocks, hits, wins, goals against average, saves, save percentage, and shutouts. So when we're talking about rankings today, just keep those categories in mind. All right. So I guess we got to start, and you're looking at it, and obviously the, the big names are at the top. The guys you'd expect, like the McDavid's, like the Dry Saddles, like the Matthews. But your hot takes, I guess, the, the the ones that are, in your opinion, the the biggest opinions you got, I guess. We'll start with the first one you got, Ilya Sorokin, goaltender, New York Islanders. Great season. Uh, one of the favorites to win the Vesna. But I guess why is he one of your biggest hot takes? Is? Yeah, so when I say hot takes, what I mean is just names that I expect I might get some pushback on based on where they're placed. So Ilya Sorokin, Sorokin good is not exactly a headline, but... 
I do wonder if I'll be alone in having Sorokin as my number one fantasy goalie, which I do right now. Typically, that spot was reserved for Andre Vasilevsky or Connor Hellebuck, these guys that get crazy volume. But if you look at Sorokin, what he's done with the Islanders, we know his rate stats are always elite. He's never been below 2.40 goals against average, never been, never been worse than a 918 save percentage. And what changed last year, he crossed the 60 start threshold. So now... You have Sorokin becoming a workhorse. 60 starts in today's game is considered a lot. So once you've added that element to his game, his fantasy profile, to me, he has everything you want in a fantasy goalie. That's why he's my number one for this year at 16th overall in my rankings. Which I, I will say I thought was a little bit high just because of goalies in general are just a tough one. But Sorokin was one of my best fantasy players all year last year. And I had him and I had uh, Shesterkin. So like, it's pretty in goaltending and a lot of times I was trying to decide who'd go in um, for what but I guess the one thing why people might think okay really but the, the Islanders is not they're not a great team but you know a full season of Bo Horvat maybe this is a group that can kind of push forward we'll see but just the more games we see out of Sorokin I do believe that this is a guy that is going to be one of the first goalies picked for a while in your fantasy league uh next one Eric Carlson assuming this is the Carlson you're talking about uh but now he goes to the Pittsburgh Penguins and uh Ooh, that was a, I gotta say, that was, that was a Saturday or a Sunday he was traded. And I remember having a, I was writing an opinion piece about it on the car ride to the beach, uh, more on the beach later, but uh, I guess, uh, well, what's, what's your thoughts here for Eric Carlson? Yeah. So coming off a 101 point season, the most points by defenseman in any season in 31 years, it feels weird to have Eric Carlson as my number six fantasy defenseman, which is what I do right now. It's where I have him. Uh, and I have him 37th overall. Actually, in this week's update of the rankings, I actually dropped him as, as a result of this trade. Uh, the reason why I dropped him was just the fact that he's going to have to compete a little bit with Chris Letang. They play similar roles, power play one, right shot. I'm obviously dropping Letang a lot more. He was a major follower in my rankings because Carlson is going to get the benefit of the doubt. That's why they traded for him. He's going to be the one that gets the default look at PP1, but there's still going to be some minutes, I think, siphoned away by Latang. It's not like Latang's going to be a third-pairing guy in Pittsburgh now, right? So I think it hurts both of their values, uh, which is why I never loved the fit in Pittsburgh for Carlson in the first place. The other reason to drop him, I've said it before, but he played all 82 games last year. Before last season, in his first four years as a San Jose Shark, he missed 27% of all their games. And suddenly in his 30s, now he's healthy. I find it hard to believe he'll stay healthy again for an entire season. The other thing, and I've said this before, I do believe there was nothing to play for in San Jose at the end of last season. I think he was selling out for offense. Why not? You saw how bad his defensive numbers were. It's probably because he was going for 100 points. He may as well. There's nothing else to do in San Jose. So I think he'll have to be a bit more disciplined in Pittsburgh on a team that has designs on making the playoffs. I could see his point total going down to maybe 70, 80 points. Yes, better supporting cast. So again, I still have him as my sixth best defenseman. That's still good, but I suspect I'll have him lower than a lot of other people. I still don't love Pittsburgh's blue line, but with Carlson kind of leading the way, I dig it. I think Carlson is back to being this guy you can count on again. You know, last year was obviously the best year he's ever had, but I, I kind of am starting to believe that this is something where we're not going to go see him go get 40 points next year or just completely fall off the map. As long as he stays healthy, you know, he's playing high right now and he's now got even more motivation where he's on a team that's just trying to push forward and try to say, like, we're trying to keep this group competitive for a few more years. I think to the, him, that's going to be exciting. That's going to be re-motivating. So we'll see about that. Uh, Andre Kuzmenko from the Vancouver Canucks. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so typically if a, if someone uh, debuts in the NHL with 39 goals, uh, you're going to be pretty bullish on his prospects for the future, right? It sounds like a future star. I'm pretty skeptical on Kuzmenko being able to repeat what he did last year. His shooting percentage was 27.3. Just to put that in perspective, that is the highest shooting percentage by any player who had more than 100 shots in a season in 34 years. The last guy to have a number that high was Craig Simpson, and that's in the 80s when goalies were just wearing, you know, face cloths for pads pretty much, right? So it's impossible. Like 273, that would be a good batting average in baseball in today's game especially. It's just not possible for Kuzmenko to score on that many of his shots again, not even close. So to me, we're going to see some regression, and that's why I have him at 96, which to me feels very low for someone coming off a 39-goal season, I suspect people other people other prognosticators will have them a lot higher unless they see the same problem that i see which is that unsustainable shooting percentage 
All right. Uh, this one's going to be interesting. Adam Fantilli, a player with zero NHL games play. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I was curious if I was on an island with my rank of Adam Fantilli as 143rd overall. I looked at uh, NHL.com, our buddy Pete Jensen, friend of the show, their rankings over there, and they don't even have him at all in their top 250. So I guess I really am. This is a true hot take. But at the draft, we were there after the pick. I went over to Yarmo Kekalainen and GM. I asked him about the pick and it, you know whether they expect at the time he hadn't turned pro yet, but what they expected of him. Of him and and Yarmo said, "This guy is going to play in our top six. We're not going to be bringing him in to play on the fourth line." So he pretty much guaranteed that we're going to see Fantilli in a scoring line role. That means all he has to do is beat out Boone Jenner, who's a solid player, but he's not an elite talent, for the right to play with Johnny Gaudreau and Patrick Laine. And even if he doesn't, maybe he's going to play with his old. Michigan buddy Kent Johnson and I just think people overlook how good of a prospect Adam Fantilli is I know you don't Stephen but to me even though he went third overall I see a big comparison in 2015 with Jack Eichel who in many other years would have been the top pick I think Adam Fantilli would have been the top pick in many other drafts as well he's a really talented offensive player can do it all at both ends of the ice I think he's going to be pro ready his style of play and I think he's going to be at least a 60 point player as a rookie I really do so 143rd I don't think it's too much of a stretch yeah a couple things I'll add to him there it's watching the world championship and watching him try to adjust to that men's um the men playing against men playing against pro pace he definitely did struggle at points but that second half of the tournament I thought he looked really good and it was when he was moved off the top I think it was see, the first or second line he got moved to the 13th forward where he actually started to really shine it was kind of like okay prove yourself here go go show what you're capable of here we have an extra roster spot we can call someone else up instead and i thought that's when he started to really kind of show through and i don't expect him to get a ton of points you know i i think you know if he gets 35 points to me that's still a success as long as he's playing that full year because you know while i do expect a better season for columbus it's still the columbus blue jackets they're still not the highest scoring team on the planet they're still going to have some issues in net i would have to assume um so it's not going to be a super easy season um, but I do think that this is a guy that's going to be a really nice long-term get. Um, so I guess the watching him, like, I feel like he's getting underrated when we just looked at the guy who had one of the greatest freshman seasons in the history of college hockey. And you mentioned back in the old days when the goalies barely like were there, they were kind of just a suggestion more than an actual like position in hockey. Um, you know, when guys like Paul Correa were scoring all those points in the NCAA, that was the same thing, except the goalies were even worse. So you know, I think we can't take in like for granted just how good of a season he had there. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what he's able to do. It wouldn't have hurt if he spent one more year in, in college and, and try to chase that national title. You know, him, Frankie Nazar, that'd be an unbelievable one too. But uh, the Blue Jackets are going to be okay with having him there, I'd say. Uh, and the last one is uh, Bowen Byram, a guy who, you know, could still play a pretty big role for the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, so I have Bowen Byram inside my top 150 players, which to me feels pretty high for a guy who has not exceeded 42 games in an NHL season. But if you add up what Byram has done so far, okay, in his past two seasons, 72 games played, 72 games, 15 goals, 41 points, 114 shots, 135 hits, 80 blocks. So that's really good production. And he's only 22 years old. So he's just getting started. 22 is a baby in defenseman years. I think the ceiling for Bowen Byram is extremely high. Maybe not Kale McCarr high, but Byram was at one time considered arguably the top prospect in the league as well before he broke in with the Colorado Avalanche. I remember back in our hockey news days before I left, uh, there was a moment where he was the number one prospect. So the pedigree is there and he's shown great productivity when he's on the ice. He just has to stay healthy. And if he does, I think he's going to be one of the biggest breakouts in fantasy this year. I think you can turn a major profit based on where he's going to be draftable. I have him 149th. I don't know if he'll be ranked that high in other lists or whether you'll have to pick him that early, but I certainly would be open to it because I think the breakout is here. All right. Okay. I like that one. I'm going to start challenging you on some of your picks now here. And we'll, we'll start with, with Cole Caulfield uh, being a number 48 Montreal Canadiens. And you brought up a good point in your, your write-up about him that, you know, in the 83 games that he's played under Martin Stanley, so just over a full season, he has 48 goals and 71 points. And yeah, no one could question just how good he was playing kind of with, with this new coach. But you mentioned 50 goals isn't out of the question at all. I, I don't know. I feel like 48 
is a bit high given that he still plays for the Montreal Canadiens, a team that's going to be in the, the rebuild, and they didn't draft a forward to go make a, a huge splash up there. So I guess, uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, to me, goal scoring is still probably the most valuable commodity in fantasy hockey, and Caulfield has already shown on a per-game basis that he's currently one of the best in the league. So like you said, 48 goals in 83 games since St. Louis took over, and that is with the, the supporting cast that they have in Montreal now, or if not worse than what they have in Montreal. They've slowly added a little bit more since last season, right? They brought in Alex Newhook, and we're going to see Caulfield playing with Nick Suzuki again. And to me, they've already shown they have that chemistry. Caulfield is produced as an, at an elite goal scoring rate with Suzuki and both players are young. They're theoretically going to keep getting better. Caulfield has not hit a ceiling yet and he's still scoring at almost a 50 goal pace since Martin Cialini took over as coach. So to me, I don't see any reason why he can't keep getting better at his current age. It's just a matter of can he stay healthy for a whole season? Very similar to what I just said with Bowen Byron. But I think if Caulfield plays 75 games, he's capable of scoring 50 goals this season. And to me, 48th overall, if that's the case, it's going to be too low. And we'll see him ranked even higher next year. Uh, Stuart Skinner, you have ranked at uh, 117. And you do bring up kind of the point I wanted to bring up. It's like, you know, he doesn't exactly have the number one fully like wrapped up in Edmonton. We're expecting another big season of the Oilers. So we should expect them to compete for a lot of wins. And that could be good for goalie stats. But I don't know. I just, I, I'm not sold on, on either Stuart Skinner or, or Jack Campbell. I think Skinner, those numbers were pretty good as a rookie, but at the same time, like they weren't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not sold on either of those guys being huge fantasy players. But what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I actually think that you and I agree more than you might realize on this. And to me, 117th overall is pretty low for Stuart Skinner. I think I've priced in the fact that I'm also not too confident in him. If I knew he was going to replicate what he did during the regular season last year and hold down the starting job all year, I think he would be 30 spots higher, 40 spots higher in the rankings. He'd be probably a top 10 fantasy goalie, just given the situation in Edmonton, very improved team. They're looking pretty stacked. They're Stanley Cup contenders. If you're the starting goalie on that team, that should be a really valuable fantasy position. But I have him down at 117th because of the fact Jack Campbell remains a threat. We saw Stuart Skinner. He was pulled, what, four times, I think, in the Stanley Cup playoffs last year. So he has not worked out all the kinks coming off that rookie season. So there is a little bit of risk there, which is why I have him where, where I do. Uh, to me, having him there is sort of my way of saying, okay, he's in a prime position. It's a nice fantasy role to have, but I don't know for sure that he'll be able to hold off Jack Campbell. Uh, sticking with goalies, I guess. Uh, Logan Thompson. Uh, I don't know if his number were here directly, but... I know he's below Aiden Hill, and I just I can't agree with that one. I just I think people kind of forget how good Logan Thompson was. I know, you know, the I think that there was there were a point we were looking at him getting Vesna trophy votes, not not a serious contender to be the winner, but like there was a lot of attention there early on, and he was a like he definitely received some Calder votes. Um, but then that injury, the second half that year taking him out essentially for all about one game. Um I don't know. I just feel like Hill being higher than him is more of a recency bias thing. But I, I feel like they got to give Thompson the, the benefit of the doubt early in the season, given just how well he played. I know, again, that some of the surface level stats, nothing spectacular. But for a guy who's having to come in and basically be a starter as a rookie, given his track record, I think that there's still a lot of potential for him to, to be a really good goalie here. So I felt him being much lower than Aiden Hill. I, I didn't agree with that one. Yeah, I think... You know, recency bias is a good way to put it, but my point in ranking Hill higher, and I have Logan Thompson down at 231st, is the Vegas Golden Knights are going to have recency bias toward the guy that took them to the Stanley Cup. And they are paying him now $4.9 million a year. Money talks, and that is not the salary of a 1B. That's the salary of a 1A. So clearly Aiden Hill is going into the season as the starter. They would not be paying him that much money if that wasn't the case. And when he's got a ring, it would be a slap in the face for them to not give Hill the first look. And I agree, Logan Thompson's been very good in what we've seen from him, but it's still a relatively small sample size. And Aiden Hill is another is a guy that we were saying a year ago had been pretty good in Arizona too. So in his mm -hmm. small sample size, he's also given plenty of reason for confidence. So I do still think Logan Thompson's draftable because just the way Vegas uses their goalies, I don't think Aiden Hill is going to start 60 games. I could see it being something like, you know, 45 or 50 starts for Hill and you have Thompson in the 30 range. So to me, that makes him draftable. But when he is clearly the 1B going into the season, coming off a major injury that cost him the year, 
and has a small sample size, there's more downside with him than with Hill. And that's why I have to have him as the 1B. All right, fair enough. Uh, Max Domi at 214, a guy that this could just be me only, and only me thinking about this. But, man, watching him play with Mitch Marner those years ago, and I'm, we're talking like essentially a decade ago now at this point, but watching those two guys play together and the chemistry, there were very few junior players that could see, saw that chemistry, which makes me think that they'll give – him a chance on that first line with with Matthews and, and Marner, but I know at two fourteen that doesn't kind of suggest that, and and part of the reason why is you know there's going to be some competition. Yes, and if we see in camp that Domi ends up winning that job and he's on the top line, I'll obviously be giving him a significant boost in the rankings. But going in to this season, this t- going into training camps, there's a rule for Max Domi in fantasy. If he's on a bad team, he's good. If he's on a good team, he's bad. And that's just the way it always goes. He put up great points on Montreal. He did quite well in Chicago last year. Then he gets traded to Dallas, and he's a third liner. The year before, traded to Carolina, he's a depth player. So when he's on a good team, he plays lower in the lineup, and he typically is not known as a great defensive player, so you have to kind of hide him and shelter his minutes a little bit as well. He just he doesn't play as much on these good teams as well. So to me, if Domi's going to be fantasy relevant this year, he's going to be having to play the left wing to get up there. He's not going to surpass... Austin Matthews or John Tavares for a center job on the top two lines. His avenue to get in there is the left wing spot on one of the top two lines, which will mean beating out Tyler Bertuzzi, who is earning more money to play for this team than Domi. He has the inside track. And it means beating up Matthew Nice, who I think has potential to be the long term first line left winger. So I just don't know if we can bet for sure on Domi doing that. That's why I'm being cautious with that ranking. 214th. But there's room to grow depending on his deployment early in the season. Uh, number 242, the last one we got here, is Lucas Reichel from the Chicago Blackhawks. And just for reference, you've got him right below Antti Ranta, who's got two other goalies he's got to fight for starts in Carolina. Uh, but Reichel has a chance to play with Taylor Hall and Connor Bedard on, on the first line. Now, again, no guarantees here, but based off of what we've seen from Reichel, we know they like him. They're patient with him, not rushing him in and, and getting him those reps in the AHL. He's got nothing to prove there. I think he's going to be a top-line player for this team, at least in the short term. But 242 for me feels a little low. Yeah, I think it's a fair argument. Uh, to me, it's going to come down to are they willing to play Lucas Reichel at what is not his natural position, right? He's played left wing and center throughout his career. He's not a right winger, has never been a right winger. So it would mean playing right wing if he's going to get on that line with Taylor Hall and Connor Bedard. That, that is the reason I have him lower. I anticipate him being on the second line playing left wing or center. And I agree. He's a good prospect. He has nothing left to prove in the AHL. I do like his potential. Um, but to me, I'm just being a bit conservative with the ranking because I don't know if he's going to be on Bedard's line just based on the positional breakdown. And if he's not, then his his company on that line too is not going to be very sexy. So similar, I know it sounds like a cop out, but it's like, okay, similar to Domi. If they, if he is on the Bedard line, I will obviously jump him, but that's, the, that's just straight up true. If we find out that Reichel is going to be on that line, then I'm going to be really excited for him and he'll be one of my breakout picks. As of now, I just don't know how that depth chart is going to shake out. I was hoping you would use that explanation, actually. Because, yes, yeah, I, I have seen him in my viewings play all three, four positions, but you are correct. He doesn't typically play on the right side there. So um, I, I just for the sake of having fun, they really only need one good line next year. Let's be realistic with the Blackhawks. They're not going to have a good year. Um, another bad year would be great if they can go out there and get a guy. Um, if they can go get an Iserman, if they can go get, uh, you know, I have a demo off. Can they go, go get a, a Celebrini? That would be very beneficial for them. Uh, and, you know, the whole thing about no, not winning a lottery, not getting the first pick like tw- uh, too many times in a five-year span. Hey, if you get two years in a row, just be happy about that. doesn't matter what two years. That's still going to push you for. It happens that one of your first years is, you know, Conor Bernard. doesn't hurt at all. But it's almost like they got Bernard a little too early into their rebuild cycle. But Maybe that really pushes things forward. Um, got, got to give a shout out to Mike Gold uh, from Daily Face Up. We're talking about the prospects in the Blackhawks. I think they're a very good prospect. Cool. He doesn't agree as much. I'm going to say Frank Nazar. I like what I see from him. All right. Uh, that's it from for the rankings. Uh, let's uh, do our tip of the week for today, which is don't put any stock into the ADP data this early in the offseason. Explain. Okay. First, I just want to rip Mike Gold as well. 
you can't trust his takes considering he also tweeted this week that VHS was the best format for viewing movies. Yeah. Just just want to put yeah, that Yeah, I don't get that one. Okay, Mike. So that take was just too hot. Okay, so ADP, for anyone who doesn't know, average draft position. Uh, this time of year, most leagues are now active. You usually get your email from Yahoo saying, welcome to fantasy hockey. You're allowed to start up your league. You can do your research. And part of that research can involve looking at the data from drafts that have been held so far this offseason, the average draft position. That can give you an idea of if you have your own guys ranked too high, too low, where you can expect to pick a player when you think that player will be available. But right now, it's dangerous to use the ADP data because if you think about it, if I'm asking you, the listener, have you had your fantasy draft yet? The answer is probably no. Most leagues have not drafted. The sample of leagues that have been drafted is small. So the ADP data is really wonky. It can look all over the place. There are a lot of anomalies. So if you're using that for your research right now, it's not the best idea. So a couple examples of how crazy it is right now. You have Pyotr Kachekov, who is the third string goaltender in Carolina, ranked ahead of Jordan Cairo, 75 point player. You have Ryan Graves, like stay at home defenseman. Ryan Graves is ranked in ADP ahead of Mark Shifley. <laughs> so just stay away <laughs> from that ADP data. It will normalize as more and more drafts are inputted, inputted, input into Yahoo system or other league systems uh, as we get closer to the fall. But right now it's just too crazy out there. So don't look at that ADP. It's wild. <laughs> that, that's an interesting one there about Shifley. But yeah, it's, uh, I think the one thing we also have to keep in mind is it's still August. There's still a lot of time for the NHL season. I'm still expecting these one high profile injury heading into the season. Um, it's good getting prepared, but we're still talking about August here in terms of uh, getting prepared for this season. Um, all right, I guess it's time for best bets, which uh, uh, it'll be interesting, uh, your opinions on these two teams in particular. Yeah, so uh, I've been looking at some of the futures odds on Botano, and they do have a section where you can bet on teams to make or miss the playoffs. And in the last season, so last year, five teams turned over in the field of 16, 31% of the playoff field changed year over year. And this happens every year. That was not an anomaly last year. So it would be very naive of us to assume that the 16 playoff teams from last year are going to carry over to next year. So once we know that that is possible, it's not probable, then okay, you look at the odds to make the playoffs. There's gonna be some great value in there. There are gonna be teams that are perceived as really bad. that are gonna make the playoffs this year. Just like the New Jersey Devils. They were terrible the season before last. They were the third best team in the NHL this year. We will see at least one team make some crazy leap this year. That's just the way hockey works. So I'm looking at two teams that I think have improved a lot and have pretty exciting odds for a futures bet. One is the Arizona Coyotes plus 900. The other is the Columbus Blue Jackets plus 520. The Coyotes, they added Jason Zucker, Matt Dumba, Sean Dursey, Alexander Kerfoot. You have Logan Cooley turning pro, which Stephen will talk about on the show later on. And... If you look at that central division, the Jets got worse. The Blues still look pretty bad. The Predators are pretty meh. There's some vulnerability there. I think the, the Coyotes have a chance to jump several spots in the central. Meanwhile, in the Metro, you have the Blue Jackets. They added Damon Severson, Ivan Provorov to their decor. Zach Wierenski, they get back healthy. David Juracek probably makes the team. That's a new top four on defense. Plus, you're adding Fantilli to the team. And if you look at the competition... In the Metro, the Flyers are terrible. The Caps are on the decline. The Islanders have done very little this offseason. And Mike Babcock, even if we don't like him, he does have a history of turning teams around. He's coming in as coach as well. So I see those two teams, Arizona and Columbus, with potential to climb. I'm not saying I'm picking them to make the playoffs, but we know that some surprise teams are going to get in, and I see those two teams as vastly improved. And those are just good odds considering how much they've improved. So I like the home run swing, especially on the Coyotes, plus 900, beauty odds. More of a fan of the Blue Jackets for those odds. I think that just, you know, if they could just get competent goaltending, I think they're they're a legitimate threat. Um, not so much on Arizona, but both teams have improved quite a bit from last year. And I don't think we can ignore that. So, uh if I had to put my guess on the two, and the odds will, will obviously be more in my favor there, it would be Columbus, but, you know, Arizona, I think, is going to put up a fight. They're going to start making noise here. And, and they they got to start soon at some point, and having Logan Cooley there won't hurt either. For sure. And that's a great transition, Stephen. You just teed it up for mm -hmm. yourself. It's finally time for me to stop talking. I've been very chattery on this episode. Time to give the floor to Stephen for a while. And 
Steven, let's talk prospects. I love that you're choosing Logan Cooley for this episode because obviously him turning pro has major fantasy implications. Do I move that he turned pro? Not necessarily. I was kind of hoping to see him go for a national title. You know, University of Minnesota, Golden Gophers were going to be a lot of fun to watch, and they just came up short. They were the team everyone was expecting to go and win the national title this year, and they lost in overtime to Quinnipiac. But uh, for Cooley to be going right to the to the Coyotes and, and likely playing what I guess to be a second line role right off the bat, you know, much different lineup from what we saw last year when Travis Boyd was starting the season on the first line. Now he's more of a fourth liner, but having a one, two of, of Baron Hayton, where we, how we, how good we saw him play last year and then throwing Logan Cooley. I really like what the Coyotes are going to be doing for their one, two with, with Cooley. I don't think you're going to ask him to take a lot of responsibility right off the bat. This is someone who you're going to keep easing in there, but he may start the year with like a Jason Zucker and a Matias Macelli. Those are pretty good players to be playing with at this point. Uh, so I do think that this is a guy that's going to continue making some noise and continue moving forward and, uh, in the first year. If he hits 40 points, that's good. If he hits 50 points, that's excellent. I don't think he's going to be a legit contender to steal the the Calder Trophy. Um, and there's other prospects that are on teams. Like I would almost put Logan Stankoven as a better chance of if he makes the stars, I would like him more as a Calder trophy. And we will have a lot of talk with the Calder at some point. But I think Cooley, just the way he was able to dominate last year, can't be understated. It's a very good chance when we're looking back a few years from now that he was the best player from this 2022 20, draft. Just the way he controls the play. He's so skilled at the puck. Uh, he's been able to score lacrosse goals. Like there's just I think I think it's overall just pure skill with the puck and puck handling is sometimes underrated because of just how well he can just kind of s- just stop plays, play a two-way game and do things like that. The world juniors were really interesting where at the beginning of the tournament, just about everyone was looking at him and say, wow, what is going on? Is he playing hurt? He looks terrible to start. And then he was basically the best player for the Americans the rest of the way. And he might've been the best player not named Connor Bedard in that tournament. So um, you get ready. Logan Cooley is going to do a lot for the Coyotes, a team that, might legitimately have its first true developed star in a very long time. All right. And I actually have a question about that. So in my rankings at the moment, I'm pretty bullish on Barrett Hayton because I love the chemistry he found with Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz. They were quite a dominant line in the second half. So I've aggressively ranked Barrett Hayton. But what do you think, if you were just to give it a percentage, what what are the chances that Logan Cooley overtakes Barrett Hayton for the number one center job this season? This year, I'd say I'm going to maybe a little higher than I should. I'm going to go 40% chance um, just because, again, I don't think it – like I just the way that top line worked, I don't know if I'd be changing that. But I just think, you know, long-term for looking at which players going to be better. It's definitely going to be Logan Cooley. Um, but Barrett Hayden, I just – you know, I'd like to see a bit more sustained success there. Uh, it kind of was more of a – he started to finally show what he was capable of after one year. But uh, I think, you know, I, I – it will be a while. You got to give him the opportunities. You don't want to give him those responsibilities of being a number one center right away. Let him ease into it and then see what happens. If it happens, I don't know, maybe it's during a slump, but I, I don't, I, I'm going 40, which is probably too high. Okay. That's fair. Fair assessment. Uh, so Stephen, before we finish off the show, it's time for the starting lineup. And I just think you're a guy that always is willing to zag and has some different takes on many things. So I'm excited for what you're going to give me for this one. For today's starting lineup, I want you to name your most overrated summer activities. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, this one was probably the toughest, and I, I really probably could say that maybe spend a good thirty minutes trying to focus on it. So I'll start at number one here: um, posting pictures of yourself drinking alcohol on like Instagram and Twitter. I don't get it; no one cares. It's like when people post pictures of their food, nobody cares, but it's like, oh, look at me. I got this funky daiquiri. I'm on a, on a, you know, a beach bar here. Like no one cares. No one, no one on the planet cares whatsoever. That's more of a young person thing though. Um, going to the c slash Calgary Stampede. Um, I went to the Calgary Stampede when I lived in Calgary. I was really excited to see what all the hoopla was for. And I almost felt like it was a crappier c and <laughs> And the c and just kind of like, the c and is, you know, talking to people who are, are significantly older than me and they're like, oh, like all the free food samples, all this stuff. Like you don't get that anymore. And the funky foods just aren't that funky these days, the ones that you get. So you're just paying a lot to eat food that's nothing special. You won't remember it. I don't remember what I had last year. 
for me, one of the things that kind of uh, sucked was that used to be the place where I get all my hockey jerseys for very cheap. Like I got like a Jonathan Drew and Habs jersey. I got like a Table Terra Vine and Hawks jersey. Like I got a bunch of them for like 15, 20 bucks. It's like these like warehouses that are trying to clear it all out. Last two times I went, I came away with nothing. And it was not because I didn't want anything. I was looking for something. They just started running out of stock. So I'm like, well, that's not fun. So I'd say those two are kind of overrated. Um, camping in the sense of like being survivalist. Like for me, when I'm going on vacation and that includes camping, I want to have a good time and trying to just like cut your own trees down and, and, and live in the middle of nowhere, have no access to anything. And or are the people who have to take like kayaks to get to certain spots to go camping? How is that fun <laughs> to get that? I think, And I see a lot of people posting about that. And I just don't get it. Uh, this one is going to offend basically everyone in hockey, but golfing most one of the most boring sports soccer is number one most boring sport golf's gotta be number two um football summer in there too but golf like man i i just nothing enjoyable about sitting there in the heat and just oh here's a hit of ball okay i can't see it all right now let's take a golf cart to the next one nothing about that same i i i used to like golfing to the point where i loved hitting the ball as hard as possible that was what i liked doing i could not play a full game of golf it's boring as it gets and every time you ask a player what their favorite thing to do outside of hockey it's always golf mm -hmm. um swimming in public pools um i'm lucky i've always had book pools growing up i've always had access to pools but i could never ever in my life go into a public pool like that's just a cesspool of nonsense um even if they're cleaning it i i just can't trust having like a bunch of kids there or i, I again no thanks don't don't ever get me near that and the last one this might make me sound grumpy, but just sitting on the beach. I don't get the people who just want to sit there for hours on the beach and just like sit in the sun and get a tan. That's such an absolute utter waste of time. Now, for me, when I'm on vacation, I like to do activities. I like to do fun things. If I'm going to New York, I'm not going to there to take pictures of the of, of their fancy buildings there. I'm going there to see a, a concert, to see a, a hockey game, to do things like that. I want to be in involved in activities they have there that isn't sightseeing um so for me the idea of going on a vacation and just sitting on a beach or like i, I could never sit my go to like i don't know barbados i couldn't just go to like the, a warm place and just sit there. I, I have to be doing something else i'll lose my mind so going in there and just sitting on the beach for a day not my thing so uh yeah i guess that's that Man, that was a sizzling list that might have been our best one ever like i need to see the clipability of this with with headlines like the Calgary Stampede is a crappier scene. You were just on fire. Everybody was catching strays. I loved it. Excellent, excellent job. Okay, the one, one thing I'll give I'll give the the, uh, the Calgary um, Stampede some credit for is their concerts. You know, a big thing about the scene back in the day were those concerts where you'd go there and you would see Rush or you'd see like you know big bands. Now you're just like you look at the list and it's like oh this is like a bar band from Burlington. But the one thing for Calgary Stampede is they still get relevant concerts. When I was there a couple of years ago and saw uh, Billy Talent, that was pretty cool. The crowd was great. And there were other big bands that have come through the last couple of years. I don't know. Just to me, it's 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 such a money pit without anything that will make you like want to go back. It's a good tourist thing. I If you live in those areas, I don't see a reason of going. But mm -hmm. the city of Calgary was a lot of fun. Um, like every night with just people just having a blast. It was a, it was a good time. And also... They, yeah, again, to go back to the concerts of the Calgary Stampede, I, one of my favorite bands at the time was Steel Panther. And they were playing a show in basically this giant tent in the downtown core. And I just kind of snuck my way underneath the bottom of the tent past security to go watch them the play live one night after work. And it was actually a good time. But uh, yeah, the concerts are still better in Calgary, but I just don't get the hype for it, to be honest. Okay, that's a fair take and a well thought out take. I appreciate it. And listeners, viewers, we appreciate you coming back for season two of Puck Poolies. That's the end of this episode. We're going to have another short break, a couple weeks between episodes, because Stephen finally deserves some vacation. And once he's back, once we get into September, we'll be on our full schedule getting you ready for your fantasy hockey draft. So we will see you in two weeks.